Hello. Yeah. Hi. Oh, I'm happy that you're here. And I'm going to talk about uh, cellular automata. Just let's check out who of you knows Game of Life. Okay, we can work with this. So what can you expect from today? First of all, I'll give you some introduction to cellular automata, the formal model. Um, then I want to give you a demo of the software that I want to present, EvoCell. Um, many different cellular automata and how to play around with them and mutate them, evolve them. Then I want to talk about artificial life in cellular automata. Cellular to automata, I've been told, sorry. Um, yeah, and then I will sum up what we've heard. So, what is a cellular auto automata? Um, it was introduced by von Neumann and Stanislav Ulam in the 40s, I think. So, the father of our computers is also the father of cellular to automata. And at this URL, you can find a very interesting paper uh, from that time, if you're interested. It's a mathematical model um, for a dynamical system that is discrete in time and discrete in space. You will see what this means later. And uh, the dy dynamical system, it depends only on local interactions. But the interesting thing is that global phenomena uh, emerge out of this local interaction. <clears throat> so, the elements of a cellular auto autom automata. Um, yeah, some regular lattice of cells. It could be a different uh, lattice, but it has to be regular. And at each of these discrete time steps, uh, each st uh, cell is in one of S different states. And of course, um, normally we code the colors, uh, we code the states with colors so that it's easier to visualize. Um, and then the state of each cell at, uh, at, at time step t plus one is a function of some of its surrounding cells at the previous time step. Um, so, yeah, imagine it like this. The sum of the neighboring cells, they influence what the state of the center cell will be in the next time step. Um, and each cell has the same relative neighborhood, uh, so the, the same neighboring cells. And um, normally the cell, center cell also in influences which state it will, be have, will have in the next state. So the center cell is also in the neighborhood. This could be confusing otherwise. Because other, normally you wouldn't think of the center cell as a neighbor of itself. Yeah, typical neighborhoods we will see. Uh, the von Neumann, von Neumann uh, neighborhood that was used in the first cellular automata that, that he automata that he introduced in the 40s. And then the, the Moore neighborhood you all know from Game of Life. Yeah, and, but we could also make the neighborhood bigger so that more cells influence the state at the next time step. Yeah, and how is this influence really modeled? Um, think about it, for each possible combination of states in the neighboring cells, you have one uh, target cell that the center cell, the target states the center cell develops into. Um, and this is simply implemented as a lookup table. Um, an example, uh, let's take the Moore neighborhood with three states. Then for each possible neighborhood, we have one target. We have one target state. Um, yeah, let's, this summarizes what I've said so far. <clears throat> and now we can uh, think, or we can ask ourselves the question, how many different uh, cellular aut automata exist? that are uh, like this. And we just, uh, this is a problem. We can just split it in two parts and 
First, let's ask us how many different neighborhoods do exist. And yeah, each cell can, each of the n cells in the neighbors in the neighborhood can be in one of s states. Uh, here's an example. So this can be in one of s states, this can be in one of s states, and this two, and this two, and this two. So there are s times s times s, s to the nth power different neighborhoods. Uh, it's uh, analogous to, uh, it's a, to a numbering systems with the base s. Um, so it's easy to calculate. So um, for each of these s to the nth power uh, neighborhood, we have to assign one target state. Um, so if everything is zero, we have to assign one target state. If the center cell is one and everything else is zero, or if it's two, for each combination till uh, every state is s minus one. We have to assign one of s target states. So completely analogous to how we calculated the uh, numbers of neighborhoods, we get there are s to the n s to the nth power different possible cellular automata auto automata. And this is a huge number. And the question is how do we find the interesting cellular aut aut automata in this huge space of possible cellular aut automata? Uh, here's an idea. We could evolve them. This is an algorithm I would propose. We start with some initial rule, and then we make some copies of this initial rule, and just change some entries in the transition function table that I've talked about before. And then we initialize the original cellular automata and the mutated cellular automata with some predefined or random cell pattern, but each with the same cell pattern. Because then differences in the transition function uh, will be seen as differences in the development of the cell pattern. I will demonstrate it shortly. <clears throat> and then we just select the most interesting CA and go back to the start. This can be iterated, of course. Um, and before I, I, I show you the demo, I want to talk about symmetries because um, if you think about the, um, if you think about, about this transition function, then, yeah, for example, if I have uh, in, the, in the lookup table, I have this entry. So when in the top left corner there's a zero, everything is zero, and these states one, two, three, then I want the center cell to be a two in the next time step. Um, normally, in Game of Life, for example, the transition function is symmetric. That means if I have this entry, I will also have these entries. These are just the rotated versions of the same, rotated by 90 degrees each. Um, usually, the, the rules I will show you ha will have this property. They are symmetric. <clears throat> and the interesting with, uh, part about the symmetric rule, if you start with a symmetric pattern, and you have a symmetric rule, it will always stay symmetric over time. And this is rotational symmetry. You can have the same with mirror symmetry, for example. So this would be the mirrored version of, of the same transition rule. OK, let's have a look at this in, in action. Um, yeah. Perfect. So um, you see the cells here, and uh, to start with, I thought about we just take some patterns you might already know. And you know uh, Conway, the inventor of Game of Life, he had to simulate the cellular autom aut automata on a Go board, and John von Neumann. He couldn't even simulate it on a GoBot. He just uh, mathematically proved that it would work. But today, of course, the computer calculates it for us. So 
Let's have a look at it. Yeah, it's the, the glider we all know from Game of Life. Um, most of the time I don't want to draw the pattern myself. I just want some random cell chunk that, that I want to see how it evolves. So this can be done easily like this. So, but uh, I promised you a new cell uh, automator, not the old ones you already know. So let's create something new. Um, first of all, I have to define a neighborhood, of course. I have to tell him which cells influence the, the, the next state. I start with the tra traditional Moore neighborhood. So this is the center cell, and all these cells uh, influence it. And I start with four states, as you can see here. I create this. Now I have it here. So what happens if I, uh, I, I switch to another color scheme so you can see it better? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just initialize it with some random pattern. And what happens if I now calculate one time step? Everything goes to zero. Because in the beginning, uh, each neighborhood goes to zero. I have to change some rules. How do you do that? Um, select it. Here, this is now again a picture of the neighborhood. And this is similar to regular expressions, really. Um, all these question marks mean I don't, I don't care what, what state is here and here and here and here. Um, but I want the center cell to develop into for example, n0 minus 1. n0 means it's the, the zeros neighbor. This is this one. n1 is this, n2, n3. So these are the neighbors. And I, uh, I just say I don't care what the neighborhood looks like. I just want the center cell to develop into the, uh, into the state it was before, minus 1. So it will just decrease in the state. And uh, when, it's, when it's zero, it doesn't uh, switch to minus one because this is not a well-defined state. It stays at zero. And I want to change all the rules that match to this pattern. I could also just change, uh, for example, 500 rules that match this pattern. But I want to change all the rules that matches. And now I mutate it and let's initialize it and step, yeah, everything decreases uh, one, one state, as I told it to be, of course. <clears throat> now this is a more interesting rule, but it's still rather boring. So let's make more cell automata. Just, um, well, and now I have four of them, and this one is the first. This still has the rule I just initialized. And now just uh, let's do some mutation. But I don't want to mutate it randomly. I want to mutate only specific rules, rules that match this pattern. Um, well, so I only want to mutate rules that have zeros here. And I don't care what's down here or here or here, but I want the center cell to develop into the third neighbor. The third neighbor is this one here. So this one, it grows out. Um, and I, let's say I want to mutate 20 entries in the, in the rule table, and I want to have rotational symmetry because it just looks nicer like this. Okay. Let's mutate it. Let's look at how it develops. Oh, interesting. Um, because, of course, the rules that I've defined here, zeros here and some, any state here, they match for here on the, on the border of this pattern, for example, it matches. And now it, it now, the states, it, they grow out, and the, 
and, and then slowly fade out because most of the rules are still just this fading out. So it's uh, really easy to create all sorts of gliders by these uh, simple mutation rules. By the way, if I click here, then um, it takes the rule that is in here and uh, produces a mutated copy here and here and here. So just so you know what happens. And it gets initialized with the same cell pattern everywhere. Um, but the development over time is, of course, different because the rules are different. Yeah. Um, and then when we have found some interesting rules, for example, I say, oh, this, is, this looks interesting, then we can continue with this one. Look what it does. Hmm. Well, you can sit in front of it forever, but um, I'll just, let me show you some rules I've already created in, in this fashion, and we can uh, continue there. Um, ah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, you, you, you can easily get um, fractal growth phenomena with it because things that look similar to this, for example. Um, and that's quite easy. How do you create stuff like this? I'll show you. I take four cellular automata now, and I'll ch start with another, um, with another initial rule. Simply, uh, no matter what state the neighbors have, I want the center cell to stay the same. So I just tell it, yeah, stay the same, stay N0. And I generate all the rules for this. I put it here. And now it's, it will just be static. It just stays the same. And if I now add similar rules to the, the last one, for example, <clears throat> then you, and I just, I change 30 entries. you get this uh, growth phenomena. Um, let's take a different. Um, so it's, so these fractals, they merge very easily, really. Um, okay. Then, um, I want to show you some um, cellular automata that uh, really do some computation in this world, but that have been evolved just with the techniques I showed you so far. This one is very interesting. Okay. What does it do? Let's just um, follow one of, of these elements here. I'll just take one. And let's, let's watch it. So it just moves. And uh, after it deposits one of these um, things, and what happens when it touches the next one. Okay, now it just um, died. That was not exactly what I wanted to show. Because it, it really depends on how many cells there are. Because of course, when it uh, uh, exits on the right side, it comes, uh, the, the left, the right neighbor of these cells is of course, are these cells, and it's, this, it's a torus topology like you. Uh, exit on one side, you come in on the other side. And it's very dependent, um, the behavior of, of these things 
depends on um, exactly how many, like, like the colliders in Game of Life, depending on in, in which state the colliders are when they collide, they can either uh, cancel each other out or they form a block or something like this. It's the same here. And what I really wanted to show, let's, they form automatically, so let's just start with some random pattern. Mm -hmm. Let's watch this here. Yeah. Okay, now they're. Mm -hmm. Let's work with this. Let's watch this. What happens now if it collides here? Ah, it's the same. Boring. Okay, I, just in case this would happen, I have some predefined patterns. <laughs> um, for example, this. So let's just watch it here. And you will notice what it does. Especially watch this region. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a binary counter. It's a decreasing binary counter. If you just interpret the presence of one of these things here as a zero or a one, and the absence as the other thing, it just calculates, counts down. And um, this rule it has just been uh, created by the techniques I've shown you so far, and it's really amazing what uh, kind of machines come out of it just by playing around like this. Um, yeah. Other rules. I'll just give you a show of some of, of, some of the interesting rules. All these can be created quite easily. And also sometimes you get some patterns like this, or rules like this, and you notice that it behaves interesting. Uh, That's really too dark. Okay. Um, let's watch it, yeah. This thing is interesting. It grows and it uh, throws out these little gliders on the side. And and if I put some of these cells here, then watch what happens. It returns. <laughs> Put some here. I just copy it. Oh, bad idea. So. Yeah, just goes around forever. <laughs> and also this deposit here. Um, and I guess it would be possible in this autom automata or in the last one to construct a Turing machine, although I haven't tried it at, at, uh, at this time. 
but you see uh, many cellular automata have some computational cap capacity that you can use. Um, of course, there are many rules that have gliders of some sort, like this. Um, and sometimes the gliders have also interesting behavior, like they can interact with each other. Show you another rule. like in this rule. Um, sometimes when they, they come near to each other, they just uh, change direction here. Let me, let's watch this region here, for example. Um, yeah, here they, they change direction, move upwards. So, but it, it's, it's, of course, it's just the, the behavior of the gliders. It's just created by the local interactions we've seen earlier. It's, there's, no, there's no other rules except the ones I've already told you about. Um, so you say, okay, interesting effects, but I don't know if you can really create artificial life in, in cellular automata with this. Um, but as a proof that you can, I want to show you some rule that's not mine, but uh, it's from a Japanese researcher called uh, Hiroki Isayama. It's called the Evo Loop, and um, it's, it's a rule. I'll just load the rule. And it comes with a pattern, with an initial pattern. Let's start with this. Oh. Okay, the screen resolution is too low. Mm -hmm. Bad. Well. Okay, I'll just copy it from here. And just let's have a look what this pattern does. Let's change the colors. Um, it, it's a replicator, it makes copies of itself, but um, it makes the copies ac according to, to a plan. Look at these states here, the white and the green ones, and look uh, at how the uh, white states extend this border of the loop. Uh, each, each white cell, it uh, lets the loop grow for one pixel. And now watch at what the green, uh, the green cells do. They int introduce a turn. And the interesting thing is that uh, this information, the white and the green states, they always circulate in the... Uh, circulate through the, uh, through the loop all the time, and at this junction here, it gets copied, like DNA has to be copied at some time. Um, and one copy, it goes out to create the new loop, and the other copy, it just stays in the loop. And if we also watch it carefully, we'll see that um, 
the information that circles around here, it codes for one side of the loop. Um, so it's, it's actually a fractal built out of, uh, it, it codes for one side of the loop, including the turn. Um, so the whole loop is, is made, out, made up by four, four exact copies of the same uh, material, like, like DNA has to code uh, in a fractal manner. You can't encode all the information of how a person looks like in, in the DNA. You can just have a compressed version of it in it. So these loops, they have uh, a compressed, compressed version of the information that is needed to build themselves up. And now the, the screen is it's too small. Uh, there are now cells that are not visible, um, but I'm afraid I can't change it, it, it now. But uh, watch what happens when sometimes um, the loops collide. When the loops collide, they are, um, they're coming to existence some uh, combinations of states in the neighborhoods um, that, that might, for example, uh, change the information that flows through the loop, or it might also lead to a combination that is considered invalid by the rules, and then this, um, this um, magenta state emerges, which uh, really dissolves the loop, like you see it here. It, it, because it dissolves the loop to make uh, space for other loops that uh, still function. So all the loops that don't work anymore, they dissolve themselves to make space for other loops. And sometimes the loops mutate. This one is smaller now, if you look carefully. This is, this is smaller and has a different shape than this one, for example. And then the mutated versions make copies of, of themselves, of course. And here we see a problem. This loop, all it, the offsprings of this loop, they get smaller by one cell at, at each time. So eventually, these loops will get smaller and smaller and uh, so small that they can't really uh, reproduce anymore. So this has a genetic defect, you could say. <clears throat> um, so, from time to time, um, you will get uh, smaller loops that are able to reproduce. And if, uh, because the loops are smaller, they can reproduce faster, and eventually the whole space is conquered by the smaller loops. I can, uh, but it really takes some time, and I don't want to waste all the time just here waiting for it. So I'll load a pattern that shows this phenomenon. Yeah, here, here the loops have already grown very small, and. Uh, all the big loops don't exist anymore because they died out. <laughs> yes. So, as you can see, this cell uh, automata, it shows evolutionary effects. Although it's really only local rules and local interaction, but it uh, has really some interesting phenomena. And, but, and now we, we can also, hmm, where is it? Reanimate there. I want to show some effects. Let's have a look at these loops. They don't do anything. Because, I'll just zoom in so we can see it better. Oh, sorry, the wrong one. Okay, we can work with this. Um, so, 
Oh, too fast. These loops, they don't do anything because they've lost an essential state that's important for, for growth. And I'll reintroduce it. I'll use some kind of gene therapy here so that it can regain this behavior. I just have to put the red state, state here and watch what it does. It just sits around, but then it travels along with the black state. And here, when the green states come along, it introduces a new... Um, uh, it grows out of here. No. Perfect, the loop, it works again. It's, it's, it's got a smaller one pixel, but let's see if the next generation does the same mistake. No, it works. This loop they can uh, successfully reproduce and will also conquer the whole space in some time. So we can experiment with these loops a little bit. And uh, for example, we can say, I want it. Um, what happens if I introduce two red states, for example? Just fix this here. Um, I put one here, like before. No, not here. This is bad. One here. And I'll put another one here. Let's watch it. Of course, it, it makes two copies of itself. It's the same thing, really. <clears throat> so, um, what can you do with this? You can genetically engineer the loops if you want. Um, I'll load another pattern. It's the Sony version of the Evo loop because uh, Sony thought, uh, well, Evo loops, they reproduce by themselves. We can make money with it. Let's just make our own version of it and sell it. Hmm? Yeah, no, it, it, it doesn't contain a rootkit, but it contains digital rights management, as I will show you. Um, so... We have it here. We, know now, we now know what the states mean. Uh, this one is red, here's a red one, here's a red one. So there will be a lot of loops growing and just look what it does. It's a loop, it's an evil loop, so it makes copies of itself like Sony promised us. <clears throat> and it also, it even makes four copies of it. Let's make it faster. Works just fine, but now they've introduced some self-destruction. And eventually you don't have anything left, but it worked once. <laughs> Thanks. So... Yeah, the one, one other interesting phenomenon is, um, as I said, the Evo loop, it was uh, created by hand by a scientist. But uh, what happens if we, if we just mutate the rules for the Evo loop? And I have some mutations here. This one is very interesting, I think. Just start with some random noise. Let's see how it grows, okay. Let's make it more oh, clear. Draw some state here. Watch this. Yeah, it's the ubiquitous Sierpinski triangle. Um, but I'm sure you know that uh, it's easy to produce these patterns with cell automata. And uh, so it's not a wonder that they pop up 
all the time because I have many of these rules. Um, for example, this one is also Sierpinski tri triangle. Yeah, it's, a, it's a nicer one. Makes all sorts of triangles. Like this. Um, and we can also take this rule and um, continue from here. Make mutations of this one. Um, so I select it. As you can see, this one, it has a different neighborhood. Then the, it has this uh, Van Neumann neighborhood. And let's just make some random changes. Look what it does. Mm. Um, with this setting here, I can uh, change how many entries in the transition rule I want to change. Now, let's take some more. Mm, okay, it gets too active. Hmm. This one looks interesting. Uh, it's, it's now it's a strange Sierpinski triangle. Let's just take and look it. Look how it develops. It is just somehow disturbed. Okay. What else can I show you? Mm -hmm. Can you look which exact rule is used now? Which, which exact rule is used? Oh, I, I don't know, really. I mean, I, I can, of course, look at the rules, but normally you, you, you don't know what, what each rule does. That, that's because the, the, the space of there are so many different rules. It, it would be very hard to create, um, to create them by hand. So uh, I want to use these mutation rules and this regular expression stuff um, to, to automatically generate interesting mutations and then I select it. And I, of course I plan to introduce some automatic uh, features that automatically detect interesting rules, but uh, this isn't done at the moment. <clears throat> want to show you an, uh, another glider with a completely different, oops, oh, this is the wrong one. Yeah. Um, with a completely different neighborhood. This is the neighborhood. Um, and there are some interesting phenomena happens. We have them here. Need some more. I'll just copy this one. Hmm. Okay. The mutation I, I uh, loaded is, is one that it's not very active, so I'll just make, uh, take one that's, that's more active where more gliders emerge, but of course they are um, related to each other. This is a mutation of the last rule. And here sometimes the gliders can pass through each other. I hope this works now. Let's watch this. They just pass through each other because the neighborhood is like this. They don't influence each other. All kind of interesting things happen. Okay. Um, so I think you have an idea what you can do with the software. And uh, I'll continue with the slides. This was the demo.
Okay, I've told you about this. Um, I've told you about the Evo loop. If you're interested in it, uh, go to this URL, then you'll find all the information about it. Um, it is a self replicating structure with DNA inside the loop. DNA is copies, we had this already. Um, yeah, we had this already, but uh, I want to come back to the theme artificial life in cellular automata. Um, because what, what generally is um, interesting about it is that uh, everything about the loops that we've seen and all the other rules, it's, as I said before, it's the uh, result of only local rules because it only looks at local rules. You could parallelize this calculation, for example, very easily because you don't need global information to calculate the next state of each cell. And it, it shows evolution without such things as uh, a concept of individuals. So normally, uh, when you do genetic algorithms, you have something like uh, you have an object that represents individuals, and then you have something like a fitness function, for example, that gives each individual a fitness, and then you, you select the n fittest individuals and mutate them somehow, and you go to the next round. All this isn't, wasn't, wasn't here in the Evo loops. There was no concept of an individual loop. It was just a pattern of cells. But, it, uh, but for us as observers, it looked like an, an individual loop. But it, it's, it's not an entity in the program. And it, it's like ourselves, for example. We consist of atoms. And uh, I don't think there's a program running that, that, that chooses the fittest humans and mutates them. No, it's just happening by local interactions of molecules with each other. So this is, this is the closest, I think, we, the closest to artificial life we really have, because there we don't need this concept of a fitness fun function or concept of individuals or hard-coded genetic algorithms. It all, all happens uh, out of the inner dynamics of the system. Yeah, and the Evo loop rule I've showed you, it's an existence proof of artificial life in cellular autom automata because I've already calculated how many rules there exist for some neighborhoods and some, some number of states. This is a huge number. And by showing the Evo loop, I've, I've shown you one point in this huge space. And I've proven that, that there is at least one interesting point in this space. So by using evolution or other uh, things I demonstrated, one could explore this space and maybe find uh, much more interesting rules. And um, that's, that's what the software really is, is written for. Because I haven't seen such software before. That's why I started it. So that brings me to the end. Um, yeah, I say it again. There's a huge space of possible cellular automata. Uh, I've presented some tools for exploring this space. And I gave some existence proofs that there are some interesting points in this space. And I hope I got you interested in cellular automata again. And if you're interested in the software, you can, of course, get it here, source code included, with all rights on your side. Yeah, that's it. Are there any questions? <laughs> He asked if, uh, if I've done anything in more than uh, two dimensions. Um, the engine, so the, the classes that are behind this, it supports arbitrary neighborhoods, arbitrary dimensions, and everything like this, but the user interface only supports two-dimensional stuff. But, and, uh, and it would be a problem for visualization, but the classes that are behind it are really abstract. They can do anything. Uh, and I've tried it once in 3D, but uh, I didn't have any visualization code, so it, it was awkward. 
Um, yeah, if you look Google for 3D and cellular automata, you'll find some things. Yeah. Uh, it would be very interesting, really, to to do this. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the Evolube. You mentioned that it was. Uh, Created on purpose by this researcher, and how many rules does this uh, evolution consist of? It's about uh, 500 rules, uh, but with symmetries and all this, it, it gets more, but about decent. Uh, then there are many default rules, for, so for most of the states, it, it just dies. The, this test state develops, so it dissolves everything again. Um, yeah, 500 rules and some more because there's symmetries and stuff like that. But and can, can, can one say if this is the minimal set of rules? So are there any rules which, which you don't need also? Um, it's very hard to prove such things mathematically. I don't know if you can say this, but uh, I, I can tell you something about the history of the Evo loop because it really goes back to John von Neumann. John von Neumann had this, um, had this idea, why, why did he invent cellular automata? automata? Because he wondered why uh, living things can reproduce without degenerating, or even get better with time. And so he uh, designed this cellular automata with 29 states. Um, and it, it is really a machine, if you, if you see it. I tried to, um, there, there's an uh, open source implementation for the automata John von Neumann created, uh, but it has some weird uh, self-written compressed uh, file, file scheme, and so I wasn't able for today to uh, extract the rule out of there and load it into my program, otherwise I would have shown it to you but you can find it on the internet. It's really a huge cellular machine that has some cellular tape where it reads states out and constructs uh, an, an, an another machine according to the information on the tape. Then there's a second machine that can copy tapes. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a tape for the machine that can uh, create another machine out of a tape. And you have a tape for this machine and a tape for the tape copier. And then the tape copier also copies the tapes and then you get uh, re uh, reproduction, perfect. And interesting, uh, von Neumann didn't uh, see any computer simulations of it. He just showed it mathematically that it works. And today there are simulations, but he, he died way too early to, to ever see it. And some small parts of this cellular machine, they are, they are similar, similar to the loop. They are similar to the Evo loop. And Christopher Langton, I don't know, if, uh, he's an artificial life researcher. He just took the rules that are needed for this loop and, and made a self-replicating structure out of it. But the problem with this loop from Christopher Langton, it was that in the paper he published, he didn't define many, many uh, st uh, possible states. And so nobody knew what to do with them. And usually you just did something and then eventually the loops just crashed into each other and became dysfunctional. And so then this Japanese guy came along and said, we need some way to clean the space up again. And he added uh, some states and some transitions to, to do this. And that, that's where it is now. But I don't know if, if probably it could be done with lesser states, with different neighborhoods. But it's hard to find the optimal solution to this or to prove something like this. Yeah? Um, I have a question for in more complex rules. This is all a proof that the original game of life you can create, that you can create, um, um, you can create, create any Turing machine, yeah? Self reproducing machine. So, what for do you need 500 rules if you can do the same with three rules? Um, um, this, this goes, uh, first of all, because I think it's interesting <laughs> in itself, although, and 
then a Turing machine is not everything because of course you can create uh, Turing machines with Game of Life and I've seen Game of Life patterns that calculate prime numbers or stuff like this. But uh, if you just uh, start with a random Game of Life pattern, you won't get anything interesting. And uh, the binary counter we've seen, the decreasing binary counter, it uh, just forms out of random data. I, I loaded a pattern now because I didn't want to sit here 10 minutes doing random initialization, waiting for an interesting pattern to emerge, but it, it uh, gets into existence just by itself, just by creating random uh, chunk. And because this is also what we are, I mean, or living things, you, there's no creator that creates initial pattern, <laughs> I think. Um, and uh, so it has to form out of random stuff. And I'm trying to look for uh, cellular automata that form out of random patterns. Cellular automata. Um, who created the rules for the cellular uh, automata, which works on the random state? You mean in the universe or here? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, it's this, the same problem delegated to a different level. So. You're right. Yeah, I, I don't oh, yes, want to discuss it's this it's now, but <laughs> maybe later. Okay. Other questions? No. Yeah. Just go. Yeah. Yeah. Just. Da hinten war auch die Frage. The Evolup rule set was clearly designed by a scientist, but the rule set for your binary counter. Did you design it or did it uh, occur just by mutation? It was by mutation. Uh, I can show you some precessors because I saved the rules along when I designed the rules so I, I could show it to you. Um, so this was the original Gardner as I called it then. Yeah, and it looked like this. It, I don't know how I got to this, but I just started with some initial rules and mutated along. So this was this rule. It looked interesting, and then I, then I made this by mutation. Um, but here now everything died out. So I made it more active by adding random rules, basically. And then it got the ones I, I showed you. This, this, this was the rule that produces the binary counters. As you can see here, now here there are binary counters, totally out of random data. Um, for example, here is here's a mutation of this again. Okay, so this was really created with mutation, not, not designed in any way.